So, in in the in the idea of that we kind of talked about a little bit earlier of, of making the most of your instrument and using uh, lots of color, uh, I thought I would just kind of walk you through my treatment of a couple of these uh, well-known, well-loved chestnuts. How many of your choirs sing the Majesty and Glory? In the past. Uh, how many? <laughs> How many of your choirs sing My Eternal King, Jane Marshall? In the past. Uh, in the past. <laughs> um, so what if, what if we just walk through My Eternal King? Now, again, we don't all have a, a fabulous, what is it, 92 ranks? 92 rank uh, uh, organ with three enclosed divisions. Uh, this is an incredible uh, instrument for choral collaboration. <laughs> Uh, as well as other things. Um, but the point of what I'll demonstrate here is for you to think colorfully, even beyond what's going to balance. Uh, think colorfully about how can we paint the text in these animals. Um, so, in, at the beginning of my trophy, I love playing this as if I'm commanding a big string orchestra. Um, and so I have drawn all the string stops, no flutes, just all the strings, and coupled them at eight and four, and put on all swells to swell so that for the first one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight measures, that I can just build this beautiful arch of tone. One of the things that I like to uh, always keep in mind. It, and I mentioned this earlier in the master class, is that the best place for moving the swell box is when you're on a long note, because that's where the ear is waiting for something to happen. Because on the organ, we have steady state and tone. So if there can be a kind of direction given to it, uh, such as in the third measure of this piece, then it's really wonderful. So let me walk you through this intro. <laughs>
You know, I always could just play this. Nothing wrong with that. But I kind of like doing a little eight and two and two thirds with, in the left hand, a gamba for this kind of slightly astringent tone. Nothing real voluptuous. There's something wonderful about this, that little resolution that I feel like comes through better on a gamba than, than the, the more opaque Gadex. So,
double down to the positive, positive Gimshorn and Celeste at four foot pitch. Then I close the swell box down. <coughs> So I use eight foot string, eight foot gibbs horn and eight foot flute. No principle, no eight foot principle, but I use the four foot octave. Because what, I'm, what is my part doing in relation to the, what they're saying exactly, it doubles it. So I don't need a bunch of thick eight foot sound mixed in there. Stop, stop. 
press grade four, three, two on each of those beats in the measure before they come in. So if we go back one more time to um, right after O Ever Loving War.
commemorate the 60th anniversary of the publication of this. As I told some folks yesterday, I've long loved this anthem. You know, it's it's on the top 10 hit list of uh, any Protestant director of music in the country, I would say. Um, and it was so wonderful to find out that she had written this when she was in her 20s singing in the choir at the church where I saw So, um, and the funny thing is, is she said she doesn't feel like it's necessarily her best anthem, but it's it's pretty amazing. Bradley, yes. one other, I haven't read that article, but one other thing that goes along with that, the Dallas composer and arranger Sterling Proctor uh, grew up in her church as a teenager, was in her youth choir, and at one point he went to her and said, I'm interested in arranging, and she said, take this anthem, I wrote a look at it, and it was that anthem. And he said that anthem inspired him to go on to do what he's done. We heard two of his arrangements. All Hail the Power and Men of Music Guys Glorified, fantastic arranger. And he said much of what he does from inspiration and actually substance comes from that anthem. From that anthem. And a great story. It's so amazing. You never know what seeds are planted. And I'm sure as a 20 year old, she, she couldn't even think of. A top to name it. She, she said in the article that, you know, with a lot of anthems, they'll just take the opening line. And she thought if, if they called it My God, I Love Thee, it would sound like Kurt Cussing. You know? <laughs> and, and so I think the, uh, the director of music at Highland Park at the time suggested uh, calling it a spiritual contemplation which she said sounded like something a banker would have come up with. <laughs> and so they eventually decided to give it the, the, the name from the closing phrase, uh, My Eternal King. And if you think about the architecture of that, of, well, of the piece as a whole, but the text that she said, the, the whole piece is about the opening line and the closing line. My God, I love thee, dot, 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 solely because thou art my God and my eternal king. The whole middle section is uh, is a laundry list of of the 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 things that are not the reason we love God. We don't love God because we hope to escape hell. We don't love God because we want eternal life. We don't love God. This is not a transactional relationship with God. It's 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 uh, it's solely because God is our God and our eternal King. That's the reason that we love. Him. And so I. As many times as I've done that, it, it, it's, it's always powerful when you have that seed planted at the beginning that comes to fruition, that glorious climax at the end. It's like walking into the throne room of God <laughs> by the time you get to the end. I have just a question. Yeah. Well, I, I moved over here so I could see what the you were playing on. Uh, okay, on, on the second page yes. of that, uh, when you came here, when you added a point, yes. uh, were you playing both of them? Manual, or was it, were you so Those, I was soloing that out. That's so, what I thought. Yeah. I, but I, I realized I couldn't see it. Yeah, you. yeah. Great question. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Here's another fun trick that I like to use. Uh, is to set two divisionals, one without the trim and one with the trim. So I can have the Barbra Streisand effect. <laughs> So that you, when you get to the end, you can straighten the tone out. So. And it's another reason I like a lot of times, I think right now the trim is not working on the solo, but it's, a, it's nice to be able to set maybe seven and eight seven without the trim, eight with the trim, because a lot of times you're playing a flute solo up here in this range, so to have same kind of nuance that an actual flutist might. Okay, so let's now look at the majesty of the floor. It's funny, I have, I, my wife is a flutist in the Dallas Symphony, and I always get so excited when I find a beautiful, a beautiful harmonic flute, and I'll tell her, oh, I found this flute, it sounds exactly like you. Uh, <laughs> like she just like shakes that. her head. <laughs> yeah. So we all know this anthem, I would, I would imagine, Majesty and Glory. Um, lots of things that you can do with color with this. Um, uh, lots of imagery uh, when we get to the birds of the air, the beasts of the field, the fish of the sea. Let me make sure we have time for all of that. Yes, we do. So um, I'll just walk you through what I do with this, as well as when we get to the build up in the middle and then the meltdown at the end. So the beginning of this is kind of, I always imagine, you know, being out away from the city, looking in, into space, that this opening is very ethereal as it's written. So finding one of the softest celestes on the organ, a gims horn or a flute celeste, something that's broader scale than a gamba celeste is, is really nice. Something that's really quite ethereal.
now E4 and 2. Although that could be fine with you if you had really soft E4 and 2. Uh, if anything, I'm probably just going to stick with 8 foot because I'm already acting kind of as a super coupler to everything that the choir is singing. So that's one of those places where it's helpful for me to know where I am. suddenly I'm going to be in their range. So if I'm only playing eight foot, then I'm going to be right with their eight foot. So, so by adding a four foot, I'm giving myself that, giving them a little bit of
suddenly becomes a simpler texture. Just has a lot of 
Actually, I'm hearing the third. So, I thought, well, I still want a 32-foot effect. How could I get that? So, if you have really soft flute celebs, you can add that at 16. by soloing out, you know, or you could be a little more subtle by it. Restraint is the better part of valor. Knowing, knowing when to when to do that and then when to get out of the way. And a lot of that comes from just looking at that texture of what the, the choral parts are doing and knowing how I can kind of augment and help that. Because once they start transcending the earth and filling the heavens, they're building, so all I need to do is just provide a harmonic uh, underlay that crescendos them. Any other questions about what I did or why I did what I did? <clears throat> so, if, if you come away with nothing else, I would say uh, it would be looking even more closely at the text and figuring out whether, whether you're playing hymns or you're playing an anthem. What, what can I do with this instrument that I have that really maximizes the color, the use of color, and how could I use my imagination to paint the stars or the birds or the beasts or the, the fish of the sea uh, using the instrument? Because um, I, I maintain that the organ is, is uh, one of the most colorful instruments uh, that we have at our disposal. You, you literally have an orchestra at your fingertips. And if you can find those ways to use those colors in service of the music, it not only engages people even more, but, uh, but hopefully can preach a sermon in and of itself that they might, um, might have a deeper experience, not only in the text, but of all of the music by what you do as, as the organist and collaborative artist. So any questions about choral accompanying using the organ? Um, what any particular challenges you have with the instrument you play? A question about a uh, different style, like a Bach or Handel, that's very pianistic and has a lot of left hand octaves. Yeah, yeah. So you play all those notes with your feet? <clears throat> I, you could do that, or if you really want to uh, make life easy for yourself, you, if you have a 16 foot stop in, get a manual. That's a great opportunity. So, say, I, I'm, I'm not thinking of anything. Well, yeah. Say, we all have to play Hallelujah Chorus uh, on Easter Sunday. 
Sunday, or a lot of us do. But you might not really want to spend all the time working with <laughs> big 16 foot stop in uh, on one of your manuals then you um, can save yourself a lot of work by <laughs> just playing the left hand part on that 16, 8, and 4 with whatever then lighter sparkly right hand sound you might have going. Okay. Now say you're doing something softer. Um, you could easily uh, use uh, some other combination. Thank you all very much. If you have any